Okay, uh, welcome everyone. I'm very happy to see so many people in here at 10 a.m. in the morning. That's not a very often thing to see at DEF CON. Um, I'm going to talk about multi-platform malware within the DotNet framework. Um, but before I start my speech, I'll have to make a couple of announcements that will probably help you to understand the speech better. First of all, my suitcase got detained at the airport, so basically I was missing a holy lot of virtual machines I'm going to show you later on. I restored most of them. The only one I couldn't restore is Vista. This stuff I'll show you today will work on Vista. And if you don't believe me and have a Vista box with you, feel free to come up front and sacrifice it. Um, also, I would, have, I would like to extend a very special thank you to Chris Paget of IO, IO Active, who helped me like, greatly with those virtual machines. Without him, this speech today would not be possible. Also, don't try to attack this computer. It's offline. If you want to own me, I'm on the own the box competition. Go back there. This is my IP. If you own the box, you get to take it home. I'll sign you, I'll sign you a case if you want. So let's start the main talk. Just what is multi-platform malware? Right? We, all have, we all heard that. We maybe have like an imagination of what it's all about. But there's never been some kind of speech on this before. No one really knows what we're talking about, what's the potential. Multi-platform malware, let's just give it a quick definition. It runs on several different processes or host operating systems. Well, that's basically what the name says, right? So it should not be bound to like Windows or Linux or whatever, so it should be independent of those systems. Um, it does not need to be modified from system to system. That's a very important fact, so it's basically not, you know, you don't have a worm in different versions of it for each system, but it's the same worm on each system. It will be able to jump the systems. That's a very important characteristic, as we'll see later on, because this opens up a lot of new possibilities for hacking in general. And it will maybe anything from Chorion to virus to whatever you can come up with, whatever you co would consider malware, it could be multi-platform. So what is it not? Multi-platform malware has nothing to do with attacking common flaws. Like XSS is a problem with the stateless communication in the internet. It will work on any platform, but it's not what I consider multi-platform malware, and it's not what we're going to talk about here today. And it's also not scripted stuff, because you know it's pretty lame to run something through an interpreter and just hope that everyone gets Python installed or whatever you want to use. So why is this important? People have been talking about multi-platform malwares for quite a few months or years now. And it actually never made it to the surface. Like people are just talking and discussing theoretical, theoretical stuff. But actually, you know, the malware has a commercial interest. And apparently it has never been important enough to actually build it. So what changed within the last couple of months or years is first of all, we got more devices. Like ten years back, and I guess someone here remember that time. There was like one major computer in a corporation that kept all the data safe, where you would just work with it, and people would wire up their workstation to that computer, and that was basically it. Today we got laptops, we got every corporation's own workstation, we got those people sitting around using Mac OS, Windows, Linux, whatever they want to run, uh, syncing over AFS, FTP, whatever you can imagine, and taking, home, taking work home on their laptops, on their PDAs. So the data is pretty much split. We got those devices, and it's um, becoming worse to like, attack them. Then we got more operating systems. 20 years back, 10 years back, there was basically Unix, and that's it. Today we got Windows, Linux. We got like 200 Linux distributions on a major market. And we got more cross-system integration, as I said before. Like, when this data was still safe kept on a single system, you would not have to interface different operating systems with each other because it would just be the same. But if you have your cooperation working partially on Mac and partially on Windows, you'll have to find a way to make those computers communicate with, the, with each other or it won't work. You have more mobility, as I said before, basically taking work wherever you want. You can take your laptop, take your work, go to the park, finish it. And you have less secure security concerns because the normal people just don't care for security. Right? That's a common fact. So I'm not the first one to deal with multi-platform malware. There have been some other proof of concept codes before. I just want to thumb through them really quickly. If you want detailed information on these, like look them up on Google. 
they're well described at Semantic's homepage. The first one is like Win32 Linux MileD, which probably it's like halfway of an overrider, which just does some basic stuff, and it infects both um, portable executables and ELF binaries. Um, also, it's uh, polymorphic and metamorphic. And then we got uh, W32 uh, Linux B, which is also a proof concept virus infecting your local files. Those two have been pretty much unimpressive. And they've not spread, so no one basically cared for them. But that's about to change, because multi-platform malware has tremendous potential. And that potential can basically be split into two sections. The first one being jumping systems. Now what does that mean? No idea? Okay. Actually, I thought it would be pretty hard to like give you a scientific explanation of what jumping systems could mean, so I made up a little story um, that should show you the difference between the old common sense of operating system security and what is possible with jumping systems. So this is the old standard. This is like a little dialogue between a secret service guy and a hacker. Secret service guy, we need access to that network and we need it now. now don't look down, those in the back, you know that sentence, right? Some geek, oh yeah, right, look, I'm really sorry, um, but I was extremely busy tonight. See, when I scanned that employee's firewall, I saw that his son had an Xbox 360 connected to the internet, so I spent all night hacking it just to get his safe games. What the fuck, you know what this means? They have 200 nuclear warheads stationed around the world, and we believe that they cut $26.72 of tax last year. Now come on, it's not all bad, at least we can play games for free. And yes, indeed, that's great. Just wait at your house and keep the doors unlocked. I'll send over a SWAT team to play. So that didn't really work out for the geek, right? Now, let's take a look at what the new possibilities do to the next geek. Secret Service guy, okay, now this is your first job after you've been hired on since your previous specialist couldn't continue working due to a um, terrible headache. Also, you'll probably have heard the tales of how we managed to disarm all the nuclear warheads using a piece of paper and bottle cap, but now we need to exit that network. Um, listen, did the other guy tell you that that employee's kid and Xbox 360 is wired up to the internet? Not again, don't tell me how to save. But this is where things start to change, because actually he hacked the Xbox 360, but of course I did. He's a really good gamer. However, I also installed a worm on that Xbox that jumped to their Vista box and collected all the credentials from a target employee's pocket PC after being synced on there as well. I already mailed you the credentials. And that's actually what we're talking about here. You can basically infect whatever you want and jump anywhere you want and basically break all the security rules we, uh, we certainly obey because certainly we don't expect anything to jump from an Xbox to a Vista machine and then, you know, steal the data from, an, uh, from your pocket PC, but that's possible. So to finish things up, great, you really know a lot about hacking and our organization and our plans. Just wait out your home and keep your doors unlocked. I'll send over a SWAT team to um, congratulate you. Now let's take a look at the other great thing about multi-platform malware, and that's basically the momentum of surprise. How many of you have ever been pen testing a network? Like, raise your hands. Yeah, quite a few, right? So what is more fun, pen testing a Windows box or pen testing a Linux box? I guess many of you will like say, yeah, Windows is more fun because it's easier to own, but basically what I found out is Linux users are way less concerned with their box. If they don't have to take care of it theirself, themselves, if there's a sysadmin around that just sets the box up, they think, oh, my, I don't have to worry about anything else. And that's when this momentum of surprise comes in really handy because the old common sense of all security was, if it hurts me, then it was built for me. If you got struck by a worm or a trojan, then someone designed that worm or trojan to work on your system. But today with multi-platform malware, if it hurts you, it's just there. You're vulnerable in most cases whatsoever, and that completely changes the outlook. Now let's take a look at what your common non-Windows L user would think about this. Those are a couple of pretty popular misconceptions that I guess most of you have seen before. Like, this is very popular for people who run FreeBSD, Mac OS X, whatever you can imagine. They say, oh, I'm running XYZ, and that's secure by default. Now that's a pretty dumb idea. The next thought is, yeah, very few people develop malware for my operating system X was that, and that's actually true. Because, as you all know, malware 
usually has some kind of financial interest in the back end, and Microsoft has like a 90% market share on the end user market, so why should I invest money in creating something to attack a system with 3% market share that's probably not even able of infecting enough box to actually redistribute itself? And the next misconception is, if an MS friend of mine should be infected with malware, his PC could not infect me anyways. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, if that guy got a Trojan on his uh, computer that sends you an email, what's, what's going to happen to you? It won't run on your system anyway. Um, that's also a misconception, as you'll see later on. And I don't need to be careful when dealing with downloads, attachments, and portable media. You know, Windows users are exposed to this every day. They go to, you go to the internet, you go to MSDN, you go to any mailing list, and like every two hours they keep telling you, oh, don't open attachments from people you don't know, check everything you download, get antivirus, get whatever. Have you ever, the Mac users in here, has anyone ever told you do the same thing for your Mac? Yeah, most, most people are actually pretty concerned, uh, not, not pretty concerned about that. They think, yo, I'm default, I'm, I'm secure by default, I don't need to worry. Okay, so before we hit the demonstration, let's first get a quick look at how you can implement multi-platform malware. There are actually various concepts to doing this, and we'll just go, to, go through them quickly and then take a deeper look at the one I'm going to present here today. They're basically, first of all, carrying various versions as payloads. That's pretty simple. Like, you build a worm, you have it attack a network, you have it scan the network for vulnerabilities of various operating systems, and basically it carries a Windows, a Linux, a Mac version for the systems, it cracks the system, copies the appropriate version over there, and just continues. That's pretty simple, but at the same time, you know, it's a pain in the ass to find out what system's going to be running. This can be done if you're running a worm on the internet, but as soon as you start attacking boxes over the internet, like, good luck finding out what they're running. Next one is using cross-system complicated assembler instructions. Some guys actually managed to do this. Um, the problem was they had to patch the Linux kernel in order for it to run, which is pretty lame. Like, distribute a virus and tell the people, like, patch a kernel and then it will infect you. Cool. <laughs> also, this technique would probably only be suitable for about, like, 20 total assembler geeks worldwide, so, you know, that's not really going to be a big problem. And third one is using runtime frameworks in intermediate languages. And this is what I'm going to talk to you about today, because this actually makes multi-platform model very real, very easy to implement. So let's take a practical look at it. Pawn me and DeadNet, darling. Um, Project Akikaze, I created it about a year ago. For those of you who know Japanese, Akikaze basically means autumn, wind. I'm not pretty good at naming things. It was autumn and it was windy. And I started programming, so that's for the name. So what were the goals of creating this? The first goal was to create actually a proof of concept worm that works. As we heard before, you know, I'm not very fond of patching my kernel in order to get the malware to run. That's sort of lame. So I wanted something to really show the people that they could try it out at home without preparing their boxes and it would all actually work and this one does. Um, the second goal was to have it attack Thunderbird and spread from there, which is, yeah, we're going to do something that later why, why I chose Thunderbird. And it should also give me a chance to explore possibilities of runtime frameworks. Because anyone who's ever been working on a larger project before will know this one. You got a good theoretical idea, you're thinking about it, you think, oh, that's going to be no problem, and as soon as you start actually programming it, you'll end up having problems coming from nowhere and like racking up the whole system. So I wanted to actually do something before I claim that it's possible. There are a few questions. First of all, why .NET? There are many runtime frame frameworks out there. There's Java, there's a lot of other smaller stuff. Well, .NET has a couple of advantages. The first one is common intermediate language code is fast. And I mean fast, not like Java fast. It's almost the speed of C++. And for malware, speed is always an issue because the faster it will work, the easier it will be to put in routines, to put in all the stuff you want without the user noticing there's something wrong because their CPU is working at 100% for about five minutes after booting. Then there are several .NET implementations. Most people don't know this. Most people think, oh, the .NET, that's Microsoft, that's evil. It will only work on Microsoft. Well, that's not true. There's a Mono project. Mono works almost everywhere. You can get Mono to run on Solaris, Linux, BSD, 
even on Windows, wherever you want. On various processing architectures, there's even more. There's .gnu, which is a smaller project, completely open sourced. And there's Microsoft's own rotor implementation that actually works on FreeBSD. So basically, .NET is everywhere. Next of all, many people run it. Even though you might not be aware of this, go on the internet, download Ubuntu 704, insert the install CD, hit the DAG. After you're finished, you'll have Mono up and running on your system, even though you might not know this. Try it out with your favorite distribution of kind. Um, the .NET is so popular today. Um, and even if you're on BSD and you think, oh my, so no distribution ships with this, if you just build your packages through ports and hit OK everywhere, chances are pretty good that after a couple of days you'll draw Mono in as a dependency. Because there are a lot of libraries that are linking to Mono today. Next one is the language independence, which is a really nice feature. Well, on Java, you basically code in, well, Java. And there are some crazy, st there's crazy stuff out there like Iron Python that will allow you to run Python in the Java. But in the .NET, you can actually build a class using Python, compile it, then build another class using C Sharp and actually exit that class you build on Python beforehand without any complications. And that's a really, really nice feature because most of you will know that some things are very easier, very much easier to implement in Python than, say, in C Sharp. It does not have any virtual machines. .NET gives you direct access to the computer, which is pretty neat if you're actually developing malware. It has lots of class for platform independence. This basically means in the .NET you can ask a class to give you that user's home folder. And it doesn't care if you're on Linux. If you're on Linux, it will give you slash home slash whatever your name is. If you're on Windows XP, it will give you C documents and so on. If you're on Vista, it will give you user documents. So you don't have to worry about that. It makes it pretty easy to develop uh, code that will actually work. Um, and last but not least, of course, you know, it's developed by Microsoft, so they quite of have the hangout of it for developing stuff that will actually make your malware run. And the other question is, why Thunderbird? When I started this, a lot of people were asking me, oh, you hate, you hate Thunderbird? No, actually, I'm not. I'm, I'm using it. It's really great. And that's mostly why I used it, because I did not have to acquire any new client to just write my worm. Also, like attacking a mail client is a pretty easy way to spread a worm. You just, you know, get the SMP, SMTP service credentials and send it out to your mailing list, and that's what's going to happen. Um, and of course, you know, if you want to present multiple malware, the thing you're attacking should probably run on the systems. I could not possibly attack Microsoft, Microsoft Outlook because I could not get that one to run on on um, Linux or FreeBSD. So Thunderbird was definitely a good choice. Now, of course, that was not all good and nice. So I don't know how many of you guys are using Thunderbird, but if you set up a new account and save your passwords for the first time, you get that message. And let me just give you an excerpt of that. This sensitive information is stored on your computer in a file that's difficult but not impossible to read. Well, that definitely made my heart stop. Because I thought, you know, what have they come up to? Like salted hashes of your passwords and encrypted by some major password, I would have to recover from the binary. And basically, I spent a couple of sleepless nights until I decided to just check the files they were supposed to uh, save the passwords in. And it turns out that this incredibly cool and hard to crack encoding what was um, base64. <laughs> so this is how your standard Thunderbird password file looks like. This is for an IMAP server. It basically gives you the username and the, IMAP, the server and the password in base64 code form. It took me, I think, two lines of code to get that one right. So let's I'll give you a quick look at the code. Actually, the code is available from my homepage. It's under GPL version 2. Download it. If you're like a C-sharp geek, look at it. I'm not going to bore you with the details. If you've got questions, write me an email. Develop this further. If you do, do something incredibly cool to my code, be sure to send it back to me because I'm always interested in what other people are doing. This is the address. Write it down. Um, be aware this has a self-signed certificate. And it will enforce you to use that certificate. You cannot access this page on a plain HTTP. So it's pretty easy. Also, if you don't get to write this down, I've got like 100 business cards up here. Just walk up the stage after I'm finished, and I'll give you one of those. So as I said previously, the most important part is this is GPL code. So do whatever you want. Do the good stuff. 
I hope there's more white hats in here than black hats, but you know, you can, can never be too sure about that. And yeah, publish stuff, this will be big. This is just the main class. There are basically three classes in there for gathering information, gathering the credentials, and actually attacking the server. And what it does is it gathers the information on the system, does a few checks, and then basically circles through the email addresses it found, creates content, and sends those out through the user's own SMTP servers. So it's pretty much impossible to find out this email was sent by a, a worm because it, yeah, it uses your own credentials. This comes from your legit servers. And even though I said you could do almost everything, platform independently, sometimes you'll find those clauses checking the operating system version against fingerprints that the .NET supports and actually building if-else clauses. Sometimes you cannot get around this. For instance, you all know that on a Windows box you'll have a, a line break with slash r slash n, while you're on the Linux box you'll sl simply have slash n, and you'll have to t take that into account when you create your regu uh, regular expressions to have the worm run. So this is a pretty easy way to do it. Okay, now for the part you've probably all been waiting for. This is a demonstration. And what I'm going to do is I got VMware prepared here, and I got three virtual machines running. One, um, basically a Windows, a Linux, and a BSD. And what we'll do is I, I got the worm on the Windows version, and I'll show you how the Firefox uh, Thunderbird is configured. I'll just start it, and we'll pretty much make a round trip. So Windows will send this to the Linux box. Linux will send it f further on to FreeBSD. FreeBSD will send it back to Windows. As I told you earlier, this works on Vista. So if anyone wants to sacrifice this box, just step up. Um, actually, it works so well that this does not even touch the UAC system. So basically, this worm does not stop there. Yeah, just a few more seconds. OK. So this is your standard Windows XP install. Um, I'll give you a look of my address book and Thunderbird. Okay, so we'll just have to restart the network connection. He sometimes screws that up. Okay, hang, hang in here with me for a second. I don't know what he's doing currently, but it should be fixed in a couple of seconds. Okay, we got it. <laughs> yeah, this is all. This is what always happens if you're working with Windows. You know, it always works in your room, but as soon as you're standing in front of a few hundred people, it will just burn out. So, um, I actually got a mail server running locally, which is pretty fun. Uh, the, par the important part is right here. This is my address book, and you see there's only one address in here. It's Linux at root. I could not come up with a better domain name. So let's just try it out. I'll just double click on this one. And you see this command prompt opening. This is pretty lame. You could get rid of it, but this is proof of concept anyway. Um, actually, it out the worm outputs a few information about what messages he created, what email addresses it regained. So if you're interested in that, just you know keep the terminal open, and you'll have a lot of fun watching it work. So let's just suspend this and check the Ubuntu box because I'm pretty sure we got mail over there. And one of the things many people are afraid of are that 
those common intermediate language codes would have to be invoked manually, basically by saying mono and whatever program you want to run. Well, yeah, that's actually true, but if you've ever done this before and you're on a desktop manager like KDE or GNOME, it will ask you, oh, do you want to register that kind of um, file to any interpreter? If you just click yes, then you'll pretty much be able to double click the, um, the dot .NET executable and it will work on a double click. So I hope that I've got internet connectivity on this one. Otherwise, it's just going to be one more check. Just getting a fresh IP around here. Yeah, now we got it. So back to full screen and let's start Thunderbird over here. And who would have expected? We got an email from XP. And you all saw that this, as you can check out this email, or as you can check out once I make the date a little larger, this email was sent just a few seconds ago. Well, actually, it appears it wasn't because my box are off sync, but this is the real email. I can show you the mailbox will be empty afterwards. And it basically tells you, hi, I've recently started to try programming. This is my first code. Give it a shot. And with Akikaze attached to it. So let's just move on. We try to save that one to our desktop. And being the normal L user we are, we don't know that Xs don't usually belong on, Win on Linux boxes. So what we basically do is we double click this, and that's pretty much it. You don't see anything happening, and that's a great thing. You know, if you're, on, if you're in a Linux box and you tried this out, you'll probably think, oh, well, it didn't work. It did work. The only problem is you did not see anything. <laughs> Let's start that from the console so you see what actually happens. We're going to have two mails in the BSD box, but I guess you can live with that. So this is the output you get if you try it on the console. It says, OK, this is my username. This is my home directory. Um, I've got Firefox inst uh, Thunderbird installed. I found that email address, and I'm sending him the email I just wrote down. So let's leave the Linux box. And as you saw, I did not modify that code one single bit. It was the exact same code I used on the Windows box. And we're going to drop into our third one and do the same thing on BSD now. Actually, this says FreeBSD. It's actually PCBSD, which is basically FreeBSD, but, but it was a li lot nicer installer. And if you're building like a lot of boxes to be used about one minute each, you're going to really appreciate a nice installer. <laughs> OK, let's just get that one up to the network once more. Okay, there we go. Starting Thunderbird, this is the original version compiled for FreeBSD. This is not something like you do with a compatibility layer to Linux. This one was actually compiled to run on, uh, on FreeBSD, and um, it works. So let's check our emails, and you see we got two new messages. That's exactly what I told you, because the first time I just double-clicked, and the second time I ran from the console. So both of them arrived here. Okay, the Beamers are back online. And you'll see that the message actually adapted, because now it says, hi, I wrote this program using a new approach. What happened? Well, the worm simply checks if you got GCC installed. And if you do, it expects you to be an advanced programmer. This is pretty lame, but this is just to show that you can actually adapt to the skill level to make it more reasonable to believe that worm. So let's download it as well and try the same thing we just did on Linux. Yep. OK, there we go. Um, this time we're on KDE. So upon executing it, we'll also see, uh, oh, 
oh cool, this is cut off by the beamer mostly. But you see that there's a process working. It's definitely done by now, but KDE tends to keep those running because it expects something to restart up, but it doesn't. So that's FreeBSD. It's just a double click, right? I did not do anything extraordinary to this, and I did surely not change it. So let's suspend that box as well and check back to Windows. And if I'm not completely out of luck, we should have one email by FreeBSD waiting in the Windows box, and this should just have done a round trip. This is also why you always would want to get yourself something like three gigabytes of RAM. Because when I bought this box, I thought, oh, cool, one gigabyte. I could never use more than that. But VMware sure showed me that I could. <laughs> OK. I'll just give him a new connection. I guess he screwed up again. Yeah, you got it. Okay, he got his IP. Let's start Thunderbird once more. And yeah, we got an email from FreeBSD. It made the round trip. It's actually that easy. <laughs> and as I said earlier, you know, I, wa I wanted to show this on Vista because oh, well, everyone's always going crazy for Vista. And they said they put in that much, in that much security stuff. Um, actually, to make this worm compatible to Vista, I had to add exactly one line of code. So that was not a really tough thing to do. OK, so back to the main presentation. So I guess you're all convinced that this actually works now. Um, Let's just take a quick look at the limitations. Of course, this technique rocks, but it has flaws, of course. And both the concept of multi-platform malware has some serious problems, as well as using runtime frameworks to doing it. And even though those can be avoided, you should know about them if you want to try stuff like this out. So let's take a look at multi-platform malware in the first place. First and most importantly, it still needs to be built for every single system that you want to work on. Um, as you saw, I use, I'm using a lot of if-else clauses, checking out the system's version, because it's still not possible, at least not for me, to build a worm that will actually run on any system without any adoption. Next, it will get really nasty once we start jumping processing architectures. Because runtime frameworks, even though they're great and even though they tell you, oh, this is going to work anywhere, they tend to you know, have problems if you jump from a Spark to an X86. Um, and of course, it's just as detectable by antivirus as any other malware. So if you want polymorphism in multi-platform malware, you'll have to do it yourself. And actually, some people are doing that. I saw some uh, viral exchange groups just the other week who built a worm in C Sharp as well to also attack Thunderbird. And actually, what they did was they made it jump in between various Windows versions. But you know, five more lines of code, it would have done Linux. So in the underground of, uh, of viral exchange, this is already building up. And they know how to do uh, polymorphism and metamorphism, of course. At least I hope so. And problems with runtime frameworks are, first of all, they need to be installed. As you've seen, you know, that's not very, a very great issue. It's, they usually are installed. You may need to invoke them manually, but that's also not that a big of an issue. The real problem is intermediate languages are extremely easy to reverse engineer. You can basically get the original code back. So it won't take very long to find out what that program does. And also, if you're running an antivirus scanner on your system that does generic checking and that works with .NET framework code and common intermediate languages, it will basically be able to scan through the entire content and just tell you, oh, you know, that's not really nice. It's accessing your mail client. OK, so to sum things up a little, and we'll have a discussion afterwards because I think that the real thing we need around here is some common sense because that's not ha it hasn't happened yet. But first, you know, as you've seen, this stuff is real. 
this is not just some theoretical idea. You can actually create it. It actually works and will be here in a couple of months or years. But you can be sure that people will not stop missing out attacking Linux boxes on the way because, you know, Linux is becoming increasingly more popular. So also as malware writers for commercial interests start to look at it and start, oh, well, couldn't we grab like all the Linux boxes as well for just 5% more investments? And yeah, they can because all they have to do is write multi-platform. So this will actually have the potential to change the way we look at computer security because currently you consider network secure, but as I've showed you before, it's absolutely no problem to, th to just sync that worm or whatever you've written onto a pocket PC. Pocket PCs support the .NET framework, folks. The Xbox 360 natively executes common intermediate languages, so you can basically jump anywhere you want and expect, uh, attack those networks locally or using the wireless network or using your Bluetooth connection. Um, and actually, no one's yet prepared for that. We all expect, you know, oh, that network is not online. It's not connected to the internet. It's got to be secure. But as soon as your employees start carrying in their own worms and viruses on their PDAs, and those PDAs start attacking your Bluetooth clients for some stack overflow you never fixed because you thought, oh, we got physical controls at the entry. Yeah, that's going to be a serious problem. Okay. So anyone who has any questions, remarks, even if you want to call me an idiot, just grab a mic. I guess I got some in here, I hope for them, or we'll grab mine, come up front and ask. Just come over. Um, yeah, just uh, one question is, wouldn't the, uh, the code access security that's built into these uh, you know, IL systems actually defeat this if you set up a, like a machine config that you know, would essentially sandbox any non-signed executable? Yeah, you could defeat it that way, that's correct, um, actually, but that's kind of hard to set up for the, for the .NET framework because, you know, Microsoft always focuses on usability and they don't really care if you can secure it. You can definitely do that. Um, it's just going to be a lot of work and not many people are going to do it. We might see that in enterprises where they can do it in a domain policy. It's safe for everyone. <laughs> well, if you see this like in corporate enterprises, they'll just do this by domain policy and you'll probably see that pretty be pretty common yeah you know that's actually what I hope that's going to happen because um, you know I'm releasing this to everyone and I'm pretty sure that we have people from both sides of the ring in this room we have white hats we have black hats we have security guys we have sys admins so yeah prepare your networks do something like you just said um, try to defend yourself because otherwise you'll run into a lot of trouble later Come on, I don't believe you that no one else in here has any other, has not got any other questions. OS 10 support. OS 10 support. Um, I'm going to get that to work. It might work already. The problem is I don't have a Mac at home. But as soon as I get my hands on one of those, you can be sure that it will run on OS 10. And basically, OS 10 supports mono or the other way around. So there should be no problem whatsoever. It's basically a Unix. What about the Superlight uh, CLR? Have you tried that? No, no, I have never tried doing this on Silverlight before. I've been asked this a lot of times before, but yeah, that might actually be done later on. Or if anyone wants to just get the source code and do that, yeah, feel free, feel free to drop me a line. Yeah? So actually, just one thing, I just wanted to actually add a comment on that one. Uh, <clears throat> I've done a huge amount of research on .NET Framework, right? And the sandbox stuff actually doesn't work. Well, it actually works. I've been arguing with Microsoft for three years that they should put everybody to do this code access queue by default. And both .NET and Java are sleeping on the wheels. Because the problem you have here, right, it's not really .NET and malware, right? The problem you have here is user land isolation. The reality is not, there's no one OS out there who's able safely to execute malicious code. So what you just shown here is I can, I can take the advantage of the .NET frameworks, you know, like standard, like you got mono, you know, and there's all that to write something which would be easier than if I have to write each individual one. But the reality is that the problem here is user-line security. And I wish that we actually had much powerful demos than the one you, you know, you've done here. And I'm actually, probably, you know, I want to help you on that one. Because, 
you know, we can do way much more on that one. You know, the, the problem here is full trust. The problem is you're running with full trust with no isolation. Mono has no support for that, right? .NET has support, but nobody uses it. So the stuff I've been doing with .NET Framework is like patching the CLR, you know, putting, you know, rootkit kind of behavior on .NET Frameworks, which takes this to the next level. So, you know, this is pretty cool because it shows you that, you know, you can actually write malware or examples of malware that will run across multiple platforms. And, um, yeah. The first problem that I think Microsoft has had is that they put all this Share security the into, <laughs> they put all this, uh, security into .NET and then uh, pretty much universally everyone just wanted to know how to turn it off. It's that, all about full. Well, yeah, but I mean, well, not entirely. Like if you were to run any executable off a network resource, it would actually get turned back on. And most people actually wanted to turn it back off, and so. So it's the same problem that you got with Java, right? And now Java is great because you've got Java Web Start, which is like, do you want me to own you? Yes. And you go, boo, right? And Microsoft has the click ones, which is, do you want me to own you? And you gave us full trust. So yeah, I definitely think that we, you know, we need to bring something next year that you know, is really going to take this to the next level. But you know, very, very cool stuff. Yeah, feel free to contact me. Anyone else who wants to participate in this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm up for whatever. At, as long as we can still GPL the code and your company does not stop you from doing though, write me a line and we'll put something together. Sorry. Yeah? I just want to do, sorry. I just want to do a very cheap plugin for OWASP, right? Which is Open Web Application Security Project, which I run the .NET part of it. If you guys are interested in this, I actually want to do a lot of this stuff over there, right? So actually, I, would, I want to invite you because it's GPL, so actually, I can bring there. And OWASP is all open source, right? So, you know, we should move this stuff, stuff over there. Okay. Any way around, as long as we get some common sense. Because, as I said earlier, if we don't act now, we'll simply be overrun as soon as they actually start deploying those things. Um, yeah, that worm won't hurt you at all. But actually, just add one more line saying format C or RMRF slash and your box done for. So, so um, I, I have a pocket PC phone, and this scares the hell out of me. <laughs> yeah. um, it, it has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and Evdo. The, right now, it's only for Thunderbird. Could it be morphed into also doing like Outlook and annihilating everything? <laughs> um, if you got the .NET running on that pocket PC, which I don't know, it's dependent on version, yes, definitely. It could. Um, it could basically infect you from wherever you are. You check your emails on Outlook, on your pocket PC, and yeah, there's no problem running one of those things. Okay. <laughs> okay, so there don't seem to be any further questions, or if you got one, raise your hand now. Good. Okay, so then that's pretty much it. Thanks for coming in here, and... We've got to keep this one up. <laughs>